let me start with the uh, with the present situation uh, first of all i was surprised that that an attack was launched on ukraine uh, honestly uh, there has been a war in progress for last 9 years or for last 7 years since 2014 and i thought that that war would continue but i didn't expect an all out onslaught on on ukraine by russia uh there were uh, grievances that the russians have and have had uh, and uh, uh, th- there were concerns uh, and i thought what was happening was a brinksmanship with uh, the troop movements on the border of ukraine that the russians uh, were doing and we didn't really expect that that putin would actually launch the war but now that he has done it what we have now a uh, situation after 3 months is that it is again back to where the situation was before the onslaught which is like it is concentrated in the uh, donbas region in in luhansk and donetsk uh, region uh, so initially he started with uh, kiev and some of the other cities but the major concentration is again on 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 donbas which means uh that it is a it is a situation that has prevailed since 2014 uh, a war going on in donbas and that is what is continuing again uh, uh, so that is where that is where we are now the biggest issue is that in 1994 when ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons the p5 countries uh, guaranteed its security so initially this security was guaranteed by russia us and britain and then uh, france and uh, china joined the security guarantees so ukraine had security guarantees by p5 countries and as far as i know that's the only prominent case of p5 countries guaranteeing a nation's security but despite these guarantees in 2014 when russia attacked Uh, and took away crimea uh, there was no response at all from the rest of the four countries because russia is actually a guarantor of uh, of of uh, security of ukraine and russia itself has become a surper uh, so this is a very strange situation but this is not now in 2022 this happened in 2014 with crimea and when it happened with crimea uh, we didn't have any kind of a response from the other uh four countries from the p5 group in the un security council uh to try to reverse it so we have had a very strange situation uh since 2014 until now and now that russia has launched a full slot attack uh you have a strong response from the west uh, uh um uh and and you have a kind of a cold war uh, that is going on but let's look at the other aspect of the international response to the russian attack uh, china has not condemned russian attack india has not condemned russian attack uh, about half of the african countries have not uh, condemned the russian attack uh, so basically if you look at the whole world uh, it is divided half and half the western world is uh, supporting uh, ukraine and condemn condemning the russian attack and there is a mostly what i would call the eastern world which is china india half of the middle east half of the african countries who are uh, uh, more neutral even israel uh, where yair comes from it uh, has been quite neutral and the israeli prime minister has offered to mediate turkey has offered to mediate there may be inclination one side or the other but uh, but there has been on balance and neutrality so that is where we are the second aspect is i feel that to some extent ukraine in, in, invited this war uh, uh, unnecessarily uh, in 2008 when russia attacked georgia nato said that it would in, include uh, uh, ukraine and and uh, uh, georgia into nato ukraine should have rejected that offer uh, outright 
Ukraine has kept the option of joining NATO open, which is one of the reasons why this war has happened. From 1994 to 2004, Ukraine managed to balance uh, the Western interests and the Russian interests under the presidency of Leonid Kuchma. But after Leonid Kuchma was uh, out as the Ukrainian president in 2004, since then, Ukraine is run by a pendulum where one side it's, it's, uh, the pendulum swings towards the West and once it swings towards, uh, uh, towards Russia. And so, uh, in, uh, uh, after Kushma left, I mean, it has been uh, the two victors, the Viktor Yanukovych and Viktor uh, <coughs> Ushchenko, uh, who have been leading the two rival groups. If they had been able to reach some kind of a compromise, they would have found a balanced approach. But that doesn't happen. They went on from one pandemic to uh, one end of the pendulum to another end of the uh, pendulum. So this war is a result of uh, internal uh, lack of cohesion in Ukraine, a continuous push by NATO, and the Russian ambitions to restore the old Russian empire or to old Soviet empire. Uh, so it is a result of these three factors. And I personally feel that this is an unnecessary war. This war should not have happened. And this should be resolved as soon as possible. Uh, but at the moment, uh, there is nobody uh, who is interested in, in, in resolving it. Uh, it will be only resolved if uh, there is what they call the mutually hurting stalemate. That is the basic principle of conflict resolution. If you want to resolve a conflict, there has to be a mutually hurting statement that no party feels that they can benefit. Right now, both parties are feeling that they can win. And therefore, they are uh, going ahead with uh, aggression and counter, uh, countering the aggression. But only when they feel that there is a stalemate which is, which is hurting to both sides, they will be ready for uh, uh, conflict resolution. But I don't see that happening for the next few months. Uh, we don't know how things will turn out. So that is how. The biggest uh, uh, cause of worry for all of us, uh, people all over the world in uh, Mediterranean, in South Asia, in uh, Europe, everywhere, is if this war unexpectedly slips into a nuclear war. That if, uh, if uh, 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 Russia uses the nuclear weapons, either for a demonstration effect in uh, uh, Ukraine, in which case it could use tactical nuclear weapons, or if NATO gets involved one way or the other, and Russia uses nuclear weapon against NATO. So if, if it slips into a nuclear war, then we are facing a really dangerous situation. So I would say one question before us is how to resolve this conflict as soon as possible. But for that, one might have to wait till mutually hurt his statement. The other big question is, uh, how to prevent a possible nuclear war arising from this war, either now or in future, as, a, as an after effect. The third uh, uh, development that I see taking place here in Europe, which is very dangerous, is the militarization of Europe, the new militarization of Europe. Uh, some of the most pacifist countries are turning towards rearming themselves. So, for instance, uh, uh, Germany uh, had frozen its military budget since 1989-1990, since its reunification. But for the first time, Germany decided to increase its budget to 2% of GDP. This is a very dangerous development. Uh, uh, Finland and Sweden are thinking of joining NATO, which will include modernizing their armaments and their armies. This is a dangerous development. Far away from Europe, in Japan, there has been some discussion at the informal elite level about stationing nuclear weapons. Australia wants to have missiles, but for different reasons altogether. It's their concern about China. But So there is a remilitarization, new militarization, which is happening in Europe and in, in, in Asia. And that's, that's very dangerous. Uh, so, and of course, when you think of Japan and, and, and uh, uh, Australia, what they have in mind is really China. 
uh, it's not so much Ukraine war that they are they are concerned about. Uh, so that is the uh, so we have a situation where global security is in crisis, and I feel that the only situation, is, the only way forward is at some stage. The five permanent members of the UN Security Council, uh, US, uh, UK, France, Russia, and China, have to come together and have to find a open a dialogue on global security, both on the architecture of global security as well as on the dangers of nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction. That is the only uh, way forward that I can see, and I think the. Initiative has to come from the P5 countries, uh, 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 and China may be in a position to take an initiative there, uh, because China is uh, uh, enjoying very good relationship with Russia. Media reports say that President Xi enjoys an excellent personal uh, equation with uh, President Putin, but China is also not going over the board in supporting Russia. Uh, it is maintaining its relationship with the West. It has. Uh, major economic engagement with the West. Uh, so, uh, uh, so the P5 have to come together and have a dialogue. One final thing I would like to say is about technology. That while these crises are taking place, there is a greater and greater use of cyber technology and uh, artificial intelligence in, in the military affairs. And if this, uh, 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 goes uncontrolled, we could have wars started by, by technology, by artificial intelligence, by hypersonic missiles uh, on their own with very little human control. Uh, and that is a danger that we cannot uh, foresee. Now, this is for the immediate future. The immediate future is, is, is uh, find an end to a uh, Ukraine war, find a ceasefire. Uh, going beyond that, we have to have a P5 dialogue to restore the global uh, security. Now, going beyond that, looking at the 2030s, next decade or so, the new armament uh, 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 or uh, 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 militarization that we are seeing with Germany and Japan could be dangerous. Uh, today, you are concerned about a war between Russia and the West. Maybe 10 years or 15 years time, we might find a resurgent Germany and Japan. Uh, and they may be the main actors in the war. And we have to be careful. So before all that happens and the global security situation gets even more messy than it already is, we really need uh, a dialogue between the P5 countries. That's what, uh, that's what I would really emphasize. I'll stop there for the time being. Uh -huh. You, Chris, do you want to respond? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. First of all, thank you for this very comprehensive and very um, rather convincing presentation. Um, um, I think we, we will have several questions and one or two remarks. Um, uh, I have one simple question, which is um, maybe not simple at all. Is do you think, what do you think that India could play a role as a as a catal catalyzator to get get this P5 moving forward one way or the other? Um, and if so, at what time um, now, or we'll have to wait later? And um, are there other possibilities India could do? Um, we um, looked at the um, uh, one of the major difficulties that is coming up. Um, I, is it okay if I make more questions and then we you can answer to more yeah. than that? Um, the, um, the, the, one of the great difficulties is the, the supply chains and the enormous increase of costs of grain and, and, and other material that um, create um, destabilization of the areas. And um, uh, here the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea and the Mediterranean are of great importance to sea traffic. Um, you think, could, could India, together with Jordan, Egypt, um, 
maybe Israel and Cyprus, um, Turkey, um, um, play a role in, in, in helping the supply chain or looking at the supply chain more effectively. And the third, third question is, um, um, we, we think what will be necessary and what is happening already, you know, starting to happen, is that you need you may need this P5 global structure, but you need regional security structure. We will have um, we we'll need regional security structure with um, Lebanon, Syria, um, in the Eastern Mediterranean. We we'll need a global regional security structure in the Red Sea area. Um, you may need this in other areas too. Um, and um, you may need the regional security structures in the Indian Ocean, which we know less. If you could look at these three three major questions. Thank you, uh, uh, Yair. Um, well, first of all, with regards to the global security, I, I think India has uh, uh, been uh, active in calling for a ceasefire, uh, both in the UN as well as outside. Uh, and India believes with many other countries that uh, there should be an immediate ceasefire. And India has been calling for it. I believe there has been also some informal diplomacy between India and, and Russia uh, uh, urging for a ceasefire. But beyond this, and uh, India cannot really do much. Uh, I don't think India has a weight to push the P5 countries. I think the initiative has to come from within P5 and China may be in a stronger position uh, to act uh, uh, at, the, at the appropriate time. Though recently I heard from one of the foremost uh, experts uh, on Asian security that China may not be willing uh, to take any action now in order not to offend President Putin. And whenever they take any action, it will be in conjunction with, uh, uh, with, with, with President Putin himself. Uh, so the Chinese might be in a, in a position to uh, push the P5. They are members of the P5. Uh, uh, India can make moral appeals and so can many other countries. Uh, 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 so, uh, so I don't really seek in addition to the moral appeal, what can what can India do? India doesn't really have any political bargaining power with the with the with the with the P5 countries. Uh, Turkey has been uh, trying to make some mediation between Ukraine and Russia, and while Turkey doesn't have a great political strength, it has a strategic location uh, where the Ukrainians and Russians can go, and they have been able to use that to facilitate a dialogue between the foreign ministers of the two countries and other representatives. Uh, so there may be uh, some scope. Israel has also made an offer for mediation. And, and uh, 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 I don't know what Israel can concretely offer. But what I can see is that these other players who are keen on seeing a ceasefire soon, like Turkey, Israel, uh, India, uh, China can uh, make their voice collective and that will have some impact. Right now what is happening is that uh, all these countries are expressing individual opinions and it doesn't really have uh, uh, much of an impact. Uh, but if these uh, countries come together and express a collective voice in favor of uh, 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 an immediate ceasefire and uh, and also an appeal to the P5 to move ahead to craft the global security structure that could uh, th that could uh, have some impact. The other player who can play some role is the UN Secretary General. I was very happy to see a UN Security Council resolution supported by all the five countries including Russia, China, US, UK, France of course uh, urging the Secretary General to play a, a role of mediation in the Ukraine conflict. Uh, uh, so long as uh, the situation was described as dispute or conflict and not as an invasion. And, and this happened in the UN Security Council a week or two ago. And this is a very welcome development. So now the UN Security Council, UN Secretary General has a, has a, has a, has a role. 
to play there with regards to your uh, uh, second question about supply chain well supply chains have been have been disturbed quite significantly uh, uh, for two reasons one is the uh, ukraine war has led to a tremendous disruption in supplies of uh, food grains and fertilizers uh, ukraine is a major supplier of wheat Uh, Russia is the supplier of food grains, and all that has been hampered. Uh, and uh, fertilizers also. Uh, India has a good surplus of food grains, so India can substitute uh, some of the deficits in the food grain market. But India itself is an importer of uh, fertilizers, so I don't think, with regard to fertilizers, we can do much. but with regard to the end product which is the wheat and rice in particular we have i think at least 30 million tons of uh, excess reserves and some of them go just wasted uh, and so so india can possibly uh, increase the supplies of uh, 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 wheat and rice and i think that's very much under consideration the other supply chain which has been affected is more because of covid and the crisis in china not so much because of ukraine war and that's that's with regards to the electronic items uh which regards to some of the intermediate goods uh then uh disruptions in shipping uh and uh, uh rare earth elements now here china has clearly a monopoly uh and the chinese economy and uh, uh health situation are in crisis uh, that is a problem Uh, chinese factories are not functioning well chinese ports are not functioning well and as a result of that uh, uh, the production of many uh, of the industrial items has been affected and uh, shipping is 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 in crisis also uh, and with the fuel prices going up this pro- 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 problems will continue uh, but what you suggest uh, i agree with uh, your idea that lot of the supply chains go through indian ocean uh, coming from china going via south asia go to the middle east and maybe the indian ocean region needs to have a dialogue on supply chains uh, that may be uh, something very relevant i don't think that dialogue will provide solutions in the short run but at least it will start uh, an open discussion on uh, definition of the problem identifying the main obstacles and that could potentially lead to to solutions so an indian ocean uh, regional dialogue on 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 uh, supply chains particularly on global supply chain uh, could be something very worthwhile and that could be a way forward uh, uh, and a possible solution to get all the actors in the region together uh, uh, and it could be anywhere in the Uh, nearer to the middle east or in cyprus or wherever but i think a dialogue between indian ocean countries uh, could be uh, and and uh, maybe arfic uh, can take a lead and also uh, coordinate with the un uh, asia pacific commission uh, un escap uh, uh, un economic commission for uh, economic and social commission for asia and pacific i think in conjunction with uh, UNS cap on the east and uh, arpic on the west uh, if there could be a dialogue i think that could be uh, uh, on on uh, supply chains going through indian ocean that could be very worthwhile the third uh, question of regional security i totally agree i mean we have to work simultaneously both on global security and regional security i think the biggest uh, need for regional security right now is in europe while we need a global security process we also need a european security discourse uh, and try to see how to reconstruct the security architecture in 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 europe uh, so we it was the helsinki conference which crafted the security architecture in europe uh, way back in 1973 or there about you need a helsinki 2 to craft uh, Uh, european a uh, new european security architecture uh, so that is very much uh, uh, very much needed and uh, uh, similarly we need a middle east uh, 
or Mediterranean security architecture. There is absolutely no need. And we have to start envisioning the situation beyond the Syrian war. Right now, everything is just uh, uh, over consumed by the Syrian war. Uh, so we have to think situation beyond the Syrian war and create an architecture for, for uh, uh, Middle Eastern security. And I would say when it comes to the Middle Eastern region, uh, the water and natural resources are very important in uh, creating the vision of cooperative security in, uh, in the region. Uh, South Asia also needs to reinvigorate uh, uh, regional security. We have an association, South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, but it has been suspended more or less uh, uh, for the last few years. And that needs to be revived. So the entire world is in need of regional security architecture, either reviving it or, or creating it. Uh, uh, I totally agree with you that you look at any, I don't know about Latin America, but everywhere else in Africa also, you need a regional security architecture with uh, uh, the crises that are there. So whether it is East Asia, South Asia, uh, the Mediterranean region, the uh, African region and Europe, uh, the regional security architecture to supplement the global security architecture is absolutely required. I fully agree, Yai. Yeah. Thank you. Sandeep, could, uh, Yair, can I ask uh, something? Please. No. Yeah. Uh, Sandeep, uh, I, I go back to uh, a point you made uh, in, in the beginning that uh, one uh, way to begin uh, uh, negotiations is when there's a stalemate and there's a mutually harmful uh, stalemate. Uh, but perhaps that's, that's not all. Um, I'd like you to comment on the lack of statesmanship um, as a concept, uh, both in Europe, uh, but also internationally. Um, uh, if, if one remembers uh, earlier historical periods where uh, Europe was in conflict and, and uh, along came uh, Metternich and the concert of Europe and so on. They, there was a, a feeling that, that uh, these uh, individuals understood that you have to treat of the vanquished in a special way if you want to stop uh, the chain of, of, of conflict and, and uh, a historical disaster. Uh, there was a lack of that in the interwar year, lack of statesmanship in the interwar year, uh, years uh, between the First and Second World War. Uh, Germany was severely punished, and as a result, we had the Second World War. Uh, there was an attempt at statesmanship after uh, the Second World War with uh, the Bretton Woods and, and uh, this new um, uh, world order, but, but that fell by the wayside uh, in the midst of the Cold War. Um, then again, uh, with perhaps de Gaulle and, and uh, Willy Brandt and, and so on, there was an idea and a concept that uh, you could have a, a European a really European concept uh, from uh, the Atlantic to the Euros, uh, including uh, and taking into consideration the security uh, needs of Russia, uh, first the Soviet Union, but then a greatest opportunity, which, which as I mentioned to you, I, I witnessed firsthand uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the liberalization for a while or at least a uh, few steps, timid steps towards liberalization um, in, in the uh, 90s and, and even very early uh, 2000s. But, but again, there was a lack of uh, vision. Uh, it's, it's what uh, Reagan, during the Reagan years, uh, called the vision thing. Uh, there is no vision uh, for a peaceful Europe. Uh, what we see now is, is this um, uh, relapse into a nationalistic mania, if you will, or, or 
uh, triumphalism or potential triumphalism. This is this is a chance to bleed Russia dry and to you know vanquish uh, Russia for uh, the next uh, century. Um, there doesn't seem to be uh, anybody or or this is my question. Do you see potential statesmen out there that will, uh, because you do need great historical personalities. And, and do we have great historical personalities right now? Is Biden a great historical personality? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, Putin certainly has not uh, proved himself to be one. Uh, he proved himself smaller than, than than uh, the circumstances uh, uh, required, but surely uh, Boris Johnson is is not a, a giant of, of statesmanship. Uh, who is? Uh, you know, uh, can the Chinese offer that? I, I think the Chinese are, are sitting back because, in their mind, uh, this whole game can turn into their advantage. Uh, they can have Russia driven into their, into their, uh, into their uh, uh, sphere, um, and uh, therefore stand in better stead against the United States. The United States feels that they can uh, destroy Russia uh, and and solidify their position with Europe. So it, it's all. You know, there's there's no vision of a greater world. There there is a micro visions of of, of benefit. Uh, so I, I'm very pessimistic, and I, I I'm fortunately uh, please <laughs> prove me wrong <laughs> or, or give me a reason not to be so pessimistic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, uh... Well, to start with where you started about uh, a conflict resolution and the need for mutually halting stalemate, I think the conflict resolution process can be uh, addressed at two levels. When it comes to the actual process between the states, you will need a mutual halting statement until, until then the state parties will not come to the table. But before that, there can be track two processes which can create a background, a kind of a preparation for uh, the, the uh, uh, P5 uh, security dialogue to take place when the time comes. Uh, so this is the uncertain time which should be used for uh, <coughs> informal and track two conversations. If you look at the League of Nations or if you look at the, the, the United Nations, uh, the discussions on League of Nations started way back in 1917. The discussions on the United Nations started in 1941-42 in the middle of the war. In 41-42, nobody knew how the war was going to end and when it was going to end. And still the discussion started. And Roosevelt uh, uh, created a committee uh, of the State Department to uh, prepare a charter of a new organization uh, that will uh, eliminate the war from, uh, from future history of the world. Uh, so this discussion started in the middle of the war uh, informally. So similarly, uh, you need even now uh, discussion starting at the, uh, in the middle of the war for, uh, for um, uh, creating a ground for preparing a ground uh, uh, for a moment when the state parties come to talks, when they face the mutual, really mutually hurting statement. And there may be countries which might be in a position to do this. For example, Switzerland. Switzerland is a neutral country. And uh, even though it has uh, kind of included uh, 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 it, it went with Russia, uh, it went with EU against Russia on some aspects of sanctions, but by and large, Switzerland is neutral. And there may be other neutral countries, so the neutral countries can come together and start preparing the ground for, uh, for a time at the track to level, not at the official level, but at the track to level. So that is one. But in the end, 
it will be a question of uh, statesmanship as you as you rightly point out uh, chris uh, in the end uh, uh, we will have a new global security architecture if you have not only statesmanship but also vision and also values uh, uh, what is the value framework uh, of our societies uh, let us uh, look at two aspects just before the war started mitro was uh, not mitro uh, macron was negotiating with uh, putin and he brought up the possibility of ukraine declaring neutrality in exchange of prevention of the war so there was a possibility of preventing the war by ukraine declaring its neutrality and not i'm making a commitment not to join nato but the united states snubbed macron for raising such a possibility and slowly the other western countries snubbed macron so statesmanship is not produced out of vacuum uh, macron may not be a statesman but he tried one singular statesman the act of uh, preventing a war by uh, negotiating uh, by offering neutrality from the ukrainian side and and he was attacked by boris johnson and and biden and everybody uh, for doing that and he could not really continue on that path if you look at the war the way it has proceeded in the last 3 months the western countries and particularly the united states have placed so much emphasis on war uh, on on arming ukraine but there is no effort at all made at uh, diplomacy at all in the last last 3 3 months and as you said all they want to do is to bleed russia and they think that russia will get weakened and it will lose its credibility and it will uh, be a weak player they are not even ready to accept russia as a as a another state uh, member of the international community and they think that will solve the problem for next 50 years uh, there is no effort to try to find a solution so we don't have brand today but we don't have a willy brand because we also don't have uh, the the value among the societies and among the countries to support a willy brand what kind of willy brand to alone uh, uh, if he is going to be attacked by the international uh, uh, community uh, and therefore uh, uh, the, i i don't see an easy solution uh, now i talked about values because this whole rise of nationalism is coming out of distorted values in all societies the resurgence of nationalism we see we see it in europe we see it in america we see it in uh, uh, asia we see it in australia we see it in latin america africa everywhere i don't know from where these nationalist tendencies have suddenly come up and this nationalism is totally against globalization and globalism uh, we have in india one uh, philosophy an ancient philosophy in sanskrit it is called vasudeva kutumbakam which means the word we should look at the word as one family but who is subscribing to this philosophy today uh, india itself is uh, uh, is experiencing strong nationalism and uh, so are our neighboring countries and so are countries in europe so this nationalism has distorted the values or values distorted values have produced nationalism uh, which is the cause and effect is something that we need to uh, we need to see uh, you have uh, russia not only ambitious for restoring its own own uh, 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 old empire but it is also wanting to attack ukraine because there are strong nationalist forces and putin's main advisor alexander dubin is promoting the theory of nationalism all the time uh, so russia has multiple motives and multiple explanations reasoning for this war but nationalism is one of them so while you have forces of nationalism gaining strength it is difficult to have and you have international community which is uh, uh, undermining any effort of of uh, nationalism uh, of of uh, reconciliation and peace it is difficult to have statesmanship i wonder if if uh, uh, angela merkel if she were still the chancellor today if she would have acted differently it's a very interesting question because during the last 10 to 15 years 
Merkel showed the possibility of remaining independent and balanced. And if she had been the chancellor, what, how she would have behaved? Uh, I don't really know, uh, but this is an interesting question. I think a Merkel-Macron combination uh, might have given some lift to uh, statesmanship. Obviously, the new chancellor is uh, seeming to be very weak. He immediately agreed to uh, 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 Schloss, agreed to uh, rearming of Germany. Uh, so there is a lack of statesmanship. But there's a lack of statesmanship in Europe, uh, Middle East, uh, 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 Asia. But the fountainhead is America. It's in the United States that, uh, uh, that there is a constant search of enemies. I mean, just the Ukraine war is three months old, but five months ago or four months ago, they were talking about a possible Cold War with China. So, uh, and there was no effort being made to reconcile with China. Uh, there were some dialogues held, but they were uh, uh, conducted in the spirit of animosity. Uh, so, I don't really see any kind of a statesmanship coming from the United States uh, in the current circumstances, definitely not from. Biden uh, or the system that underpins him, it's not coming from anywhere in Europe. Uh, what could possibly happen is a number of smaller countries and mid-sized countries could come together and, 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 uh, and, and they could perhaps spread a new kind of thinking. In the end, if you look at the map of the world, you find that it's only about 20 countries which are involved in the pursuit of militarization, 20 to 25 countries which are really involved in pursuit of military. Uh, and 170 countries are just suffering for 20, 25 countries wanting to pursue war mongering, wanting to pursue arms race, and the other countries are suffering for nothing. Uh, so it's really the time for the majority of 100, 150, 170 countries to come together and to, uh, to, to tell the dominant countries that this war mongering is not acceptable. Just probe you on, on what you just said. Um, uh, without uh, meaning to be, uh, to suggest uh, historical determinism, th there is a, uh, a feeling though that there's been a pendulum uh, effect, uh, you know, uh, uh, moving from a more internationalist uh, uh, feelings and views and globalist uh, tendencies to now a more um, um, nationalist uh, di direction. Um, I mean, if you follow that sort of argument, you you can. Uh, uh, it would suggest that that pendulum swing has to finish its course uh, before it begins to retract. And therefore, we can have a chance uh, to begin again, uh, hoping for something more. Uh, not that uh, globalism necessarily solves the problems, but at least it creates a, a feeling of interdependency, uh, a greater feeling of interdependency. But what intrigues me is this uh, juxtaposition of the 25 countries and the 170 countries. Um, and, uh, you know, but it never seems that the, 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 the poor can ever stand up to the rich uh, and the powerful. Um, you know, maybe it would happen in the future, but wouldn't that be a great day? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. No, but, you know, I, I, you know, if you look at the pendulum from nationalist forces to global, global from nationalism to globalism, the last time we had the strength of nationalism was in the 1930s, which will be almost 100 years. I mean, since then, I don't recall a period at a, on a global level. Uh, of course, within the countries and within the regions, there are swings and the pendulum has much smaller swing. But the biggest fear is that before you go to globalism again, if these nationalist forces create a war, and if these wars use, and if the weapons of mass destruction are used in the war, uh, then you will have the end of the world. You will not move back to to pendulum uh, to to the other uh, uh, end of uh, pendulum. 
you might just finish the whole world and nuclear war once it starts it can be over in 48 hours by destroying almost the entire population and now with this technology of artificial intelligence being combined with the nuclear weapons the weapons can take over the war themselves so uh, we don't have the luxury of the pendulum slowly moving towards the other end because nationalism last time created a world war and it it killed or annihilated maybe 5 to 10% of the world's population but the rest of the world survived and the rest of the world progressed <coughs> now in the 2020s and 2030s we don't have that luxury because we are overcrowded with the weapons of mass destruction which can terminate the human civilization and i think the risk of termination of human civilization it's it's very real it may be remote it may be minuscule but it is real it is not it is not to be totally uh, ignored and and uh, w- the combination of nationalist forces along with the tendency of the countries to risk wars uh, as we are seeing now not only in ukraine but you have a war between saudi arabia and yemen for no reason there are tensions between china and india there are wars uh, in africa so uh, within the countries which can spill over uh, between the countries so basically uh, 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 there is a tension between china and taiwan uh, so if you have nationalism combined with tendency to proclivity towards war combined with weapons of mass destruction which are combined with artificial intelligence i would say humanity is at the most dangerous moment in the history of our species never in our history of the species we have been so close to self inflicted annihilation as before the last time a species was uh, annihilated were the dinosaurs uh, 350 million uh, years ago uh, but that happened because of a uh, 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 asteroid or something that hit the earth but it is the first time in the history of the planet that a species is trying to destroy itself is ready to destroy itself and along with it the other life forms and that makes this particular movement the most dangerous movement in the history of in the history of the planet in the last 3 billion years uh, or 4 billion years that this planet has existed uh, and 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 i think this risk is very small uh, it's remote i would repeat but it is it is not something that is uh, that can be annihilated uh, i mean that, that can be ignored totally and we might be uh, at the cusp of the last decade of humanity or the last century of humanity uh, so the biggest danger of nationalism is not uh, only fragmentation within the countries which is what the fact nationalism is causing but the fragmentation and annihilation of the entire world and the human civilization maybe one more you know um um if you look at um you you, you have um if you look at 45 onwards um you have from 45 to 1971 you have the tremendous success of what i would say um keynesian uh, the keynesian economic thinking and social democracy and you get social welfare states and that and from 1971 it breaks it breaks it reaches some of the highest point and we go into different kind of thinking where for more neoliberalism and neoliberalist activity and the globalization creates a lot of injustices and a lot of a lot of difficulties and um, the injustices create the sense of um of in internal insta- instabilities and and the nationalism and all what you're talking about and um part of the vision part of the vision that you speak about and it says to be value based the family of man but it's not only the family of man it is um how do you how diffuse this um, unbelievable um 
uh, unbelievable gap of income and injustice. Um, and um, there's a lot of work done on it. Um, there are um, some, um, I understand some Indian, Indian professors got also got a Nobel Prize on this. Um, but it has to be part of the vision how to do it. Um, not that I have the answers, but the questions are very clear. Yeah, there are two, two kinds of injustices which are creating two kinds of sustainability problem. One, there is the socio-economic sustainability problem, which is a result of the growing inequity, as you, as you rightly say, that has been growing since the 1980s. Uh, you have, uh, uh, we have the very uh, well-studied and well-researched book by Thomas Piketty, uh, where he has uh, shown how the inequality has increased since 1980s in almost all countries in the world. And it is likely to increase further. And that is because the returns on capital are a lot more than returns on returns on labor and work. So all those people who earn by, by working, which was the case with uh, human evolution for uh, societal evolution for centuries and centuries, cannot earn as much as those who have access to capital. And therefore, these inequalities are going to increase. Now, some countries in Asia, including India, China, Southeast Asia, have reduced the absolute poverty in our parts of the world. Uh, but reducing absolute poverty doesn't mean that, uh, doesn't mean reduction of inequality. And if there is inequality, there is going to be discontent. And it's going to give rise to extremist ideologies, including nationalism. So that is one kind of unsustainability, the social economic uh, uh, fault line in sustainability. The second is environmental sustainability. Uh, the way we have uh, uh, been unfair to the poorer people in the world, similarly, we have been unfair to nature. And biodiversity is getting compromised. Uh, uh, climate is getting compromised. Uh, uh, pollution is increasing. Uh, water pollution, air pollution, uh, uh, all, all kinds of... So now the dilemma is this. If you want to resolve the environmental and climate problems, then you have to invest in green economies. And you have to uh, unmake some of the industries which are already existing. Uh, you have to dissolve them. But that will create unemployment and that will increase the uh, 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 social and economic inequality is a lot more. So there is a there is a triangle. On one side of the triangle, you have uh, the environmental sustainability. On the second side of the triangle, you have social economic sustainability. And on the third side of the triangle, you have the political sustainability. Uh, now to match all the three sides of the triangle, and to put them with the right angles is the greatest challenge that social scientists have in the next one or two decades to come. Uh, because if you can't uh, uh, balance between the environmental sustainability and the socioeconomic sustainability, you will also have political instability, which will lead to conflict and wars. Uh, so this stability, uh, uh, sustainability uh, uh, triangle uh, managing that sustainability triangle or even in fact creating a sustainability triangle is uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, that we have. And, and, and at the root of it is uh, inequalities, uh, not only between man and man, woman and woman, but also between man and nature. Uh, and that is what, uh, uh, that is a big challenge uh, before us. And all the solutions that have been presented so far, like the European Green Deal and all kinds of other solutions, uh, the American Green Deal, European Green Deal, uh, they may reduce carbon emissions by uh, to some extent, 
but uh, they do not uh, explain how the socio economic injustice will be uh, will be reduced or mitigated and this is a big challenge uh, before us uh, before the social scientists to really create a new triangle uh, which balances these three kinds of sustainability uh, uh, challenges um I, I have a very different question from different um i think what you're saying is of tremendous importance um are we allowed to send the uh, the thing on to other people and check with other people that get your ideas to other people too do we have you do we have you okay to do that yeah yeah sure sure of course i think we can we could create a group of of people who have the same um to see um how we could create a small group that can work on the issues that you are relating to and no i think that's a very good idea excellent idea okay so i'll follow we'll follow up on this big yeah, no, i think it's a very good idea yeah this Yeah, are any any further questions or comments <laughs> no it is very comprehensive you know we you yeah, covered yeah. You covered quite a lot of ground we did and yeah. yeah, and um um with your thinking um uh, i think um I, i i would like to send it to you know to ambassador Omar Ifai, he works with the company with the former companies together. Mm. This is this is your your connection, but um, anyhow, we'll we'll see who. We can be. Just a, yeah. a, a last a last point. Um, I recently saw the Carnegie Endowment uh, did a paper uh, on uh, looking at the Indian Ocean as a. Uh, uh distinct space and not uh as a, as as a single space and in fact uh they've done an interesting uh interactive map that you press um and you see the choke points and the the uh, the, the directions of trade etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, i i i thought Uh, I mean, it, it's along the thinking that we've had about the Eastern Mediterranean. That if you that if you look at uh, something um, in in a in a greater context, it's easier to solve bilateral problems. Uh, I mean, if you split the space up, um, then bilateralism becomes more important. But if you aggregate the space, so there's maybe a theory of of geographic aggregation as part of conflict resolution in other words the if you can get a bigger space and a bigger concept of the space uh it's easier to face it it, it becomes a um a, a positive sum game rather than a zero sum game between specific uh people i i mean i always believed that about eastern med uh That that if you look at it as a as a as a single space, it, it it then it shows you answers rather than problems. If you look at it, uh, if you split it up, it highlights the problems. I agree. I agree absolutely. I agree. It's true everywhere in the world. That's why the Ukraine problem will not be solved just at the bilateral level. They will need a new European security discourse. to try to create a security new security arrangement to helsinki too that's really where to 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 go forward so deep thank you very very much for today and your time and uh, we hope uh, you found it as interesting as we did <laughs> yes i did i no it was very interesting for me thank you for uh, thank you for inviting me i think it was so quite pleasure. i think we had very 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 interesting discussion we didn't have too many solutions but uh, at no, least no, we could too. define the problems more sharply yeah. and thank you yair for taking the initiative thank you for uh, your wisdom sandeep we all learn from your wisdom we are very we do, we do. <laughs>